And I want to let you guys know that the single biggest focus in our Christian walk, in some sense, should be in conformity to the image of Jesus Christ, to look like Jesus Christ, to see his example of how he conducted his life on this earth, and to follow that example. Being conformed to his image is the single most important thing and glorifying God. And that's what brings God so much glory is when we walk like Jesus Christ. And I want to clearly establish that and I think we need to remember that as well, too, as we go throughout our Christian walk, that that should be what we're aiming for, even above accomplishing things, in some senses, doing good, uh, good deeds for the kingdom of God. If you are concerned about doing good deeds, you know, as there is that concern, especially when you're first born again, if you are focused predominantly on being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, the good deeds, the works will just follow in your life. You'll have so much zeal and you'll have so much love for God that it will just, it'll just shoot out of you. It won't be possible to not do those good deeds. The zeal will be coming forth from you naturally if you are focused on being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ just naturally did that which was right because he was 100% perfect, of course, right? And if we walk like that, we will just naturally do that which is good. We will just naturally do good works. And I want to say, any old person can be used by God in this life. Anybody, really. God uses all kinds of people all the time. And I know I've preached on this before, but it's such an important thing to realize that God can use anybody. But you know what? Not anybody can be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Anybody could be used by God, but what is a distinct mark that you are of God's elect is that you have Christ-like character, that you have Christ-like conduct. That is predominantly the most important thing. And let me say it like this. There are many people that will have good deeds. There are many people that will have works, but will end up in hell. But there's nobody who has Christ-like character and Christ-like conduct con consistently that will end up in hell. If you are walking in Christ-like character, and being conformed to his image, you're going to inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's a deeper conversation, but at face value, it definitely is the case. And I just want to say this once again, God uses the good, the bad, the unconverted, the converted. And I see so many people justify bad behavior, justify false teaching, justify false teachers by saying, oh, look how God is using them. Look how God is, is doing these things through their life. But that should not be the hallmark by which something is justified. And I want to say this, for those of you who are aware of the term easy believism, this is a term that I will talk about in uh, my teachings from time to time, is those who profess a faith in Jesus that is not true belief, not true faith. In other words, easy believism, right? Many of the people that are easy believists that have a fictitious belief in Jesus Christ, they will say, Oh, Noah, you're preaching works. You know, those who believe in repentance, that's works-based salvation. That's works-based salvation. But you want to know what me and my wife realized throughout our Christian journey. Actually, the people that are easy believists rely on their good works. They are accusing you many times. So just take this into your own personal life, right? There's somebody who's a lukewarm Christian in your life. There's somebody who's, you know, the Americanized Christian, right? They will say, oh, you, you, you believe in works for your salvation. But if you start to rebuke their sin, if you start to reprove their ungodly conduct, you know what they will start to do? Pay attention. They will start to name the good things that they do, that they go to church, that they read the Bible, they participate in this ministry, that they do these various different things. And eventually me and my wife realized, hey, they're accusing us of the very thing that they actually do is that they trust in their own good works. So I just want you guys to be aware of that and to not fall for that you know, false accusation that, oh, you're just trusting in your works because you believe in repentance. There is those out there who are works-based salvationists, but you cannot receive that accusation just because you believe in repentance that we are required to turn from a life of sin. But I wanted to put this in some different examples for you guys to further drive this point home about how God can use anybody. Let's say there's an unconverted person and they suddenly go to a grocery store and they're in this grocery store and they're standing in line 
and the person in front of them, their card gets denied repetitively. And let's say this person's a Christian and the unconverted person behind them goes and pays for their groceries. Is it because there is any necessary virtue in that unconverted person? No, um, most of the time, God is just using that individual in that situation. And the unconverted person could think to themselves, hey, I'm a good person. I just did a good deed right now. And there can be times where that's genuinely a good deed, right? But, you know, behind the scenes, what's actually happening is God is just using that person. That happens all the time on a daily basis all throughout this earth. And I want you guys to be aware of that. And I want to say that you can make the case that, you know, the people that were involved in Jesus's crucifixion and the surrounding events were used by God, the disciples of Jesus Christ, the Roman soldiers, Pilate, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, you know, they, they could all be said to have been used by God. Even Judas, in some sense, you could say that he was used significantly by God. Now, with this all being said, obviously God uses his saints in a distinct way, differently than people who are unconverted or false converts. But I just wanted to read this verse to you guys. You don't have to turn there. Out of Second Chronicles, the first half of the verse says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. That is what God is looking for, for an individual that he can show himself strong in and that has a perfect heart towards God. And let me say this to encourage you guys. Some of the people with the most tiny, insignificant, in the eyes of the world at least, in the carnal mind, some of the people with the most tiny, insignificant lives are going to bring the most glory to God on the day of judgment. Some of the people that are forgotten about, their life just seems redundant and monotonous, and there's not like, you know, mighty moves of God per se in their life and they just faithfully serve God in the circumstances they find themselves in, they will bring the most glory to God. Even more, like, let's say a hundred times more than a Joel Osteen. How is this the case? Somebody like Lazarus, a crippled person, a sick person, you know, like in the Bible, some of those stories and their lives, especially, will bring such a, a unique glory to God. And why is this the case? more than Joel Osteen, who has, you know, a church the size of a football stadium. And, you know, you could say, obviously, Joel Osteen's preaching a false message, but nevertheless, right? You could say, look at all those good deeds Joel Osteen is doing. However, on the day of judgment, somebody who has a seemingly tiny life, there's not much eventful things going on, can glorify God so much because the attributes of God are magnified in their life such as the power of God, such as the goodness of God, the provision of God, in that how that individual learned how to rely upon God in the situation that they found themselves in. You know, the attributes of God, like I said, all of these different good things, these attributes about God can be so magnified in how that person learned to rely upon God in how that person relied on God's goodness through his grace, right? And so on and so forth. And I wanted to turn now to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. Essentially what this passage is saying, that the plan of the gospel is to do this in verse 10, or one, one aspect of the plan of the gospel, one result of it, is to show the manifold wisdom of God in verse 10. The manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what this passage is saying is that the attributes of God will be so magnified in the spirit realm by what God is doing in his saints, by what God is doing in the church of God. All of the spirit beings, all of the angels and demons, and, and when you think of angels and demons, you might just think of like singular beings. There's a whole host of different kinds of creatures within those two categories. In demons, obviously, we know the conversation of the deliverance ministry. But, uh, you know, also in the regard with uh, regard to the angels as well, too, there's diverse different kinds of beings and creations within the category of angels. But nevertheless, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, God will be glorified before these beings based on what, what uh, is being done in the saints of God. That's really important to take into consideration. 
And I believe this is one additional benefit, as the passage actually says, as to why God gave salvation to human beings. Think about this. When the angels are in heaven, their obedience is further, con uh, is further concealed, is further secured by what is going on in this earth, the punishment of fallen angels and the redemption of human beings. Think about that ripple effect of the salvation of human beings that it will eternally bring about in the angels of God a, a, a greater level of worship, a greater level of gratitude towards God, a greater glimpse, revelation of who he is. So this is much bigger than about us. This is what I want to say in this message. Our salvation, yes, God loves us and, and he saves us because he loves us. I don't want to take away from that by any means. But another element of why God saves us needs to be taken into consideration is that because the what the work of God does in the saints brings about such a magnification of his attributes and glorifies him before all of the hosts of heaven, before all of Satan and, and all of Satan's demons, the attributes of God are being magnified and God is being glorified, right? So going back to what I said earlier, you might look at different ministries as a Christian and think to yourself, oh man, I haven't led thousands of souls to the kingdom of God. You know, I haven't traveled the earth and preached the gospel to all different people in different countries and nations, but that's not what it's about first and foremost. It's about God being magnified in your life in whatever circumstances you find yourself in, right? So it can be very easy to, you know, in your life, think, man, I'm, I'm not accomplishing big things many times. And, you know, everybody could struggle with that from time to time, right? But what is the most important is that you look like Jesus Christ, even when no one is looking. Because all of the beings, I believe thousands of beings around us in heaven, in the heavenlies, in the second heaven, and in the third heaven, are seeing whether you choose to obey God or choose to disobey God. And the, the demons are jumping up and down for joy if you live in sin. And, and, and uh, contrary to that, God's angels are rejoicing and God is being glorified if you walk in righteousness. So let that be a further encouragement to you to do the right thing when nobody is looking, to not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. I believe when we have a greater understanding of what's going on in the spirit realm, it helps us to be that much more accountable. You know, it's so easy to just be like, oh, nobody's looking, you know, and especially with regards to God as well, too. Like how many times, even as Christians, could we compromise maybe with little pet sins and be like, nobody's looking, but God is ultimately looking all the time. And that should be the greatest motivation uh, motivation to not do that, which is evil. But um, what, what I'm not trying to say through this message is that the salvation of souls is opposed to God being glorified because actually in Luke, and this ties right in with what I was just saying to further prove it scripturally, in Luke chapter 15, we see the angels of God rejoice in heaven. There's a party in heaven, so to speak. I mean, not a carnal party, but you get what I'm saying. There's rejoicing and joy in heaven when one sinner repents. Isn't that amazing? So it's broadcasted to the whole spirit realm. Wow, that is... If, if all the angels in heaven know of this event when one sinner repents, obviously we could conclude that the, the demons can realize this at least to some degree. So that's so amazing. It sends a ripple effect through the whole spirit realm when one sinner repents as to what's going on, right? Um, I find that very interesting, right? It, it makes us look at this life that we're in as a much more broad arena you know, then then the way that we look at it by just what people see us to be and, and so on and so forth, things of that nature. And if you take that mentality of if you take them, I've realized this as well, too. If you take that mentality of, oh, nobody's seeing me, you know, so therefore I can compromise. I can do little things that are carnal or even big things that are carnal. It still comes back to bite you because in the spirit, it affects the spirit realm. This might be kind of hard to communicate. But it affects the spirit realm in such a way that even when you react, interact with other human beings, there's still repercussions. You might do sin. Wow. You might do sin and nobody see it physically, but there will still be ripple effects in the kingdom of God. It's almost as though people saw it. It's almost as though human beings saw it 
because of the ripple effect of your sin and how you go on to interact with other people and you reap what you sow. And likewise, as well, too, with regards to walking in righteousness, because Jesus Christ said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing and your heavenly father shall reward you openly. What does that mean before people in a public setting? Your heavenly father shall reward you, right? So here's what I want to say as well, too, just for another example. There could be a pastor that just faithfully shepherds 10 people, right? Uh, for 50 years and, you know, passes away, goes on to be with the Lord, and nobody ever really knows about him. That pastor could glorify God more on the day of judgment than people who did crusades, than people who led thousands of souls to Jesus Christ, right? Because ultimately it's Jesus Christ who's saving the people anyways. And this is why I don't like this whole doctrine of, Hey, how many people got saved last night? Oh, 37 people got saved last night. No, 37 people made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. You don't know that 37 people got saved last night. You know, you might be able to see the work of God, that God is moving. But to put like this numerical, you know, estimation or this uh, analysis on how many people got saved, as though you can just like popishly declare that's how many people got saved. As though just because they said, a prayer of salvation or made a profession of faith because they were around you when you were ministering, that means they're authentically saved, then my friend, you have not realized the error of American Christianity because that's like the backbone of, you know, so many false converts, so many false conversions that have come out of American Christianity. And unfortunately, you know, not to throw shade, but there's ministers that I see that are still doing this, that genuinely love God. So I think it's an important thing to be spoken of that that's how you should rather say it. Right. Let's say there's a meeting, 37 people and I'm just making up a number, right? 37 people say they gave their life to Jesus Christ. You can say, hey, we had 37 professions of faith last night, but it's a little disingenuous to say that you indefinitely know that all of those 37 people got born again. Most of those people that come to the church, even in, in genuine, good, authentic churches, right? A lot of those people, and I even see this in my ministry too, a lot of those people might not even be there a year from now, right? And, and whatever, that's not the all indefinite indicator that they're not saved, any, uh, that they never got saved or they're not saved anymore. But I'm just saying, you know, I'm just trying to get a point across with regards to that. And a lot of the people that have a lot of good deeds, they could build their 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 good deeds on a bad foundation. As 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about, there will be many people who build their life, who do their good works on the wrong foundation. They don't build on the gold solid foundation of Jesus Christ and the reward and the recognition of them doing those good deeds is just going to be burnt up on the day of judgment, right? So that's something important to take into consideration because obedience is better than sacrifice. You know, when you obey God, that's not going to happen, though. When you're when you're genuinely concerned about, I want to obey God the way that he told me to do something, the way that he laid it out in his word, and I'm not going to compromise, and I'm not going to use, you know, worldly wisdom tactics of men to try to make it make my ministry better and things of that nature but you just genuinely obey God. That's always the best thing to do. I wanted to read to you guys out of Matthew chapter six. It says in verse nine, after this manner, therefore pray ye, our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. What is the first thing that Jesus Christ taught us to pray and to be focused on? Our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. To recognize that God is in heaven, to recognize, to, to recognize that his name is holy above all else. That is what Jesus Christ told us to be focused on first and foremost. And then afterwards, that his will be done. So we are to be focused on, the, on God being glorified and his name being kept as holy even before his will being done, right? Now, obviously, his will is that we would keep his name holy and that we would revere him as he is in heaven, right? But many people have this backwards, so concerned about the will of God, but don't do the first thing first. Don't do what this passage says first, to pray and say, hallowed be thy name, holy is thy name, to revere him as holy. That Even above, give us this day our daily bread as well too, the first thing. 
is that God's name would be revered as holy. So my point is, one of my points is, you actually correctly understand how to do God's will when you're first and foremost focused on glorifying God and that you would not do anything to dishonor his name, that you would not do anything to, you know, try to withstand his holiness, right? That's really important to take into consideration. And I just want to say, going back to my point earlier, there are a lot of people who are used by God that don't make it in, even people in the Bible, Solomon, Samson, uh, Moses did not make it into the promised land, right? Or these people at least didn't die with a positive, righteous reputation to their name. And Saul, Saul as well too, you know, king over Israel and one of the kings over Israel in the Old Testament. And let's go to that passage now in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. Essentially what happened here is that Saul allowed the people that were with him to take back some of the spoils when that's not what they were told to do and to make burnt offerings, sacrifices unto the Lord. And it says in verse 22 of 1 Samuel 15, and Samuel said, speaking to Saul, hath the Lord um, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, it is better to obey than sacrifice and to hearken than to the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as the iniquity and adult, uh, idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and thou hast rejected, um, he hath rejected thee from being king. God had rejected Saul from being king. Even though Saul, in some sense, did what he was supposed to do, but in another sense, he completely didn't do what he was supposed to do, right? And it, here's the thing, it could seem for justifiable reasons, wow, that they were going to make burnt offerings unto the Lord with regards to the spoil. What's that in a modern context? I'm going to compromise in the ministry. I'm going to water down the word of God. I'm going to, you know, not preach so hard against sin. I'm not going to not preach repentance. I'm not going to speak about the controversial topics because it's going to be, you know, a greater effect in my ministry. More people are going to be led to the Lord. But obedience is better than sacrifice. It's better to obey God. You know, even if you're like Isaiah in the Old Testament, Lord, who has heard our report? You know, to be in that situation than to try to sacrifice an ungodly sacrifice. And this is what many people do as well, too, when they're new Christians, you know, is they they want to go and, and sacrifice and do this grandiose thing in ministry and fast. And, you know, when they haven't even done the essentials, when they haven't even turned from sin, when they haven't even developed a strong relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, God could lead you in different ways. I'm not speaking hyper literally there, but nevertheless, I want to I want to go back to my point now. You know, many people have this attitude that Christianity is about, you know, as I grow with the Lord, I'm going to be promoted kind of like a pseudo hustle culture type mentality. You know, hustle culture where I'm going to grind and I'm going to be prosperous and wealthy. Now, obviously, people can recognize that's not good, but you could have a pseudo mentality of hustle culture in Christianity that you know, I'm going to I'm going to grow and I'll, I'm going to do all these great and magnificent things for God. And, I, and that's great to have that aspiration. I'm not trying to take away from that whatsoever. But there can be certain senses in which you just faithfully serve God repetitively and you might not see the most. You know, you are blessed, but in people's worldly term of being blessed and the carnal term of being blessed, like your life just flourish with tons of opportunities and money and possessions and you know ministry endeavors and all of these different things but you could you could glorify god maybe more in the situation that you're in so that's the point of my message once again the title of my message is glorifying god is the highest required priority of man and we should be satisfied at the end of the day that we've glorified god regardless of the outcome of a situation if we genuinely obeyed him right and I just want to say there's times in your Christianity and your walk with Jesus Christ where things might not make sense to your flesh, why God is leading you to do different things. And you could come up with carnal reasoning that I could get more money, more ministry opportunities, more this, more that, if I just tweak God's word a little bit and I just, you know, use some more wise tactics to make things work out better. And you can use wisdom in a godly sense to prosper yourself. I'm not trying to speak against that, 
But I'm just trying to say what Proverbs cha- says in, a, in chapter three, that uh, we should not lean on our own understanding, but acknowledge God in all of our ways and he shall direct our paths. You know, many people get hung up in this Christian walk, not understanding why did God allow this? Why did God allow that? Why did, and, and that could be a genuinely good question, but sometimes what we need to be focused on is just je- obeying Jesus Christ in the midst of the trial that we're going through. And we might, and I'm not going to act like I'm some all wise person. We might not have an answer in this life. We might not have an answer with regards to some of our questions to later on in life, so on and so forth. But if we obey God, we will see his goodness prevail. And something that I want to say is that when you follow Jesus Christ, you can see God the Father is directly involved in the finite details of our lives. Like there's times where I pray about things that might be so seemingly insignificant. Like, God, help me to find my phone. I can't find it. Like, God, show me a sign about my son or, you know, different things like that. And, um, you know, it's actually not good to have that mentality to act like God doesn't care about it. Because, Because we are supposed to worship God in everything that we do, right? Our entire life should be a sacrifice of obedience unto God, right? And if that's the case, obviously God is directly involved with those finite different details. Let's say you glorify God just by, you know, saying hello to somebody, saluting somebody like it says in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, if God's going to ask us to obey him in that regard and those finite details of life, don't you also think that he's going to be deeply involved in those finite details of life? I definitely think so. And I just want to encourage you guys with regards to that, to what I was previously saying. And on the Sermon on the Mount, we can see not a sparrow falls from he- uh, the sky without God knowing about it. All the hairs of our head are numbered, right? So there can be a sense in which you're asking this question of why in a rebellious type way, in a stubborn type way. Wow, thank you, Jesus, for this word right now. You can be asking why, not because you're genuinely trying to know. And this happens all the time in conversations between us as humans, but even with God, right? Right. You're asking why, why, why? Not because you genuinely want to know, but because you're frustrated with how things have turned out. And that goes back to rebellion is is the sin of witchcraft. But um, there could be times where it's a rebellious why as well, too, or it's an excuse. You think about this. If you were in a a foreign country and there was a major war going on and your, your leading commander says, go jump into this trench right now. And you say, why? I don't understand why I have to do that. Then three seconds later, a grenade goes off and, you know, you lose a limb or something like that. That would be very foolish to ask the question of why when you're in a spiritual warfare like that. So I just want you guys to take that analogy into consideration. I'm not trying to speak like all together, like a genuine why of God. Why are things going on like this? It's not inherently rebellious. That's not inherently not of God, but... Nevertheless, I just wanted to speak on that a little bit because I know many Christians get hung up with regards to why things turn out the way that they do. And I think one of the answers lies in this message that I'm talking about today is God calls us to certain circumstances where we will glorify him so magnificently in our obedience and going through that trial and eternally in heaven as well, too. The fact that we leaned upon God and obeyed him in the midst of that trial will rot, will bring about uh, an eternal weight of glory throughout all of eternity to glorify God. So I know I kind of went all over the place in this message, guys, but, you know, I was also just going where the Lord was leading me to share some different things. So that's pretty much what I have to say with regards to this message, guys. Once again, just a reminder that obedience is better than sacrifice. Don't think you can cut corners. Don't think you can do different things that God didn't ask you to do. Like I'm just, you have a works-based salvation in that situation, right? Or you're out, you're operating in a works-based mentality, should I say at least in some circumstances that I'm going to try and do this to make up for this thing that I'm not doing. That is the epitome of trying to work for your salvation. So don't do that. And we could all struggle like in tiny little things, right? You know, so I think it's a good reminder for us on a reoccurring basis, not just the major things, you know, like giving up willful sin when you get saved and stuff like that, but even the small details of life. 
So anyways, guys, that's what I have to say with regards to this message. Um, yeah, that, I hope you guys were blessed by it. So.